The new year is here. It didn't end with a bang for the ACC in football, and it started with a fizzled-out game between Tech and UVA basketball. All that, and how in the world will the committee pick an NCAA tournament field this year? This week on Teal and Barber. Happy New Year, and welcome to episode 35 of Teal and Barber, the Richmond Times Dispatch and Richmond.com's Virginia Tech, UVA, and ACC Sports Podcast. I'm Mike Barber, ACC beat writer for the paper, and joining me here, as always, my co host, the 13 time Sports Writer of the Year and the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, Mr. David Teal. David, very happy New Year to you and yours, sir. And you and the crew. Thank you. So uh, how was New Year's Eve in, in Casa del Teal? Uh, very quiet, although we did all make it to, to, to midnight, mostly because our nine-year-old was determined <laughs> to n- not only see the ball drop, but also to count down to the new year on her Animal Crossing Island of Kind. Awesome. So you need to have motivation, and uh, it sounds like Tiny Teal had that, and uh, maybe that carried the rest of the household? <laughs> Yes. Well, she definitely had to carry her no account parents because we were ready for bed. It, you know, there was no, there was no great football on New Year's yeah. Eve, so we were we were ready to crash at ten. But uh, she was having none of it. Yeah, I'll tell you, we uh, we cheated <laughs> because in the spirit of twenty twenty, why not? We uh, we watched the ball drop in London. Um, and the countdown there so that the, the uh, children would be awake and <laughs> functional. Um, and then we were actually going to go to bed. I decided I wanted to watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life. It's one of my favorite movies. Didn't get to watch it at Christmas time. And we, we synced it up perfectly. So It's a Wonderful Life ended at about 1158. We flipped on uh, Dick Clark's Rockin' New Year's Eve. We watched the ball drop. And David, I don't know. We couldn't have been five minutes later that we were asleep, but oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but we made it. We we get credit, so we get our, uh, our our merit badge for being awake when the ball dropped. And when we finally got to put twenty twenty behind us, kind of it, it it feels like it's it's lingering a bit, <laughs> which nobody wants now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it sure is. Nothing much has changed, that's for sure. You know, I think we, some of us kind of woke up you know, the morning of January 1st thinking it would be you know, magical. That's all behind us, and that's uh, probably not realistic. But another thing we do, we, we wake up on January 1st, and uh, we make some resolutions, and that brings us to this week's Take It or Leave It. Or we'll call it this week, Take Them or Leave Them. It's uh, New Year's resolutions, and as a bonus— If you've made one this year, please tell us what it is. Let's start with David. Guys, I'm going to leave them. I have never been big on resolutions. My wife is big on them, and she writes them down and posts them uh, in her walk-in closet, and, and she's gotten our daughter into it as well. If you forced me to make a New Year's resolution, it would simply be by the start of next football season, I want to be able to spell Ui Ungalale without having to Google it first. That is phenomenal. And as the only <laughs> resident member of this show who can pronounce his name, uh, um, I think you're well on your way. <laughs> What's yours, Mike? Well, you know, I, I have a lot of respect uh, for Mrs. Teal because I think resolutions are awesome. I've never been able to keep them. Um, I don't always <laughs> make them. I love the idea. I love the idea that it's a new year and it doesn't have to be a big goal. It doesn't have to be a specific goal. I love the idea of you go into the year with hope of something that, that you're going to improve or do better or get more out of. I, I love the idea of New Year's resolutions. So I'll take them and then I'll admit I'm the worst. I've had all sorts of resolutions year to year, health, weight loss, activity level, professional goals, uh, stuff with my family. Every year I have come up with what I thought was a really smart, heartfelt and important New Year's resolution. And I don't know if any of them made it out of the first month. And that's embarrassing. Uh, 
this year I'm setting a very low bar because of how rough 2020 was. So I, I think my New Year's resolution is going to be to eat more gourmet cheese. We, <laughs> we, we had a, a ton of really nice cheese in the house around the holidays. I really enjoyed it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go really low and easy this year. My resolution for 2021, enjoy more gourmet cheese. So uh, you gentlemen can please hold me to that because I think that's an attainable goal. That's going to be hard to, for us to monitor, though. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to rely on, on your honesty. Oh, I, I would never lie about gourmet cheese. <laughs> now, David, against all odds, the college football season looks like it's, it's going to reach the finish line. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, it, it's it's going to this worked this big experiment. It worked. Alabama, Ohio State, they're going to play for the national title right now. That's scheduled for January 11th in South Florida. I, I note that because everything seems to be constantly potentially changing. But that seems to be where we're headed. The ACC, it put two teams in the college football playoff. That's a big deal. Clemson yeah. and Notre Dame. And then it saw both of them get beat pretty convincingly in the Ooh. national semifinals. That was part of an 0-6 showing for the ACC in, in bowl games. Obviously, this was an odd year, right? Things, things were different. Things were weird. UVA and Tech could have been in bowl games. Maybe they would have won. They passed on going. They wanted to end their year. So, David, I'm asking you, you wrote about this this week. How big a deal is this bust of a postseason for the ACC, the lopsidedness of the scores? What, what do we make of that? It is a deal. How big it is, Mike, is up up for debate. I've never been one to judge a conference's season based solely or even primarily on bowls, simply because n- number one, and although we didn't have it this year, the the huge lag time between the end of the regular season and the bowls. You know, who knows what transpires there? You know, teams lose their rhythm. You know, people lose their motivation. And speaking of motivation beyond the playoff now, the the motivation for bowls for for a lot of these teams is minimal. Now you have players opting out. So I I think it skews results. But 0-6 is (laughs) 0-6. And it's the first time since 1983 that the ACC has gone winless in bowls. And back then it was only 0-2. It's the first time in 19 years that the ACC has failed to win multiple bowls. And this is the first time ever that a Power 5 conference with more than three bowl teams has failed to win a game. Mm. That That's a deal. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and, and I think we're on the same page here. If they were one in five, um, it almost doesn't matter which one. Obviously, if you can yeah. get Clemson or Notre Dame to the national title. But if they were one in five, we're probably not even talking about it. But no. that zero is so bold and glaring, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it, it really is. And, and, and you mentioned the margins specifically mm. for, for Clemson and Notre Dame. Clearly, they had the ultimate motivation. They're playing for a spot in the national championship game. But, Mike, it's the darndest thing. These semifinal games in the college football playoff, since the very first one, you know, the, the very first year of the playoff, the 2014 regular season, the playoff semifinals are New Year's Day 2015. And we had a crowd of people in our house and everybody's jacked up and, you know, we're, we've got food and drink and everybody is just ready And that very first playoff game, Mm. Oregon, Florida State in the Rose Bowl was just the biggest beatdown you could ever imagine. And they've continued every single year. And we're to the point now, the average margin of the, what what are we, year seven of the playoffs. So there have been 14 semifinals. The average margin in those games is 20.9 points, three Mm. touchdowns. Yeah, and you know, it flows into the debate about expanding the playoffs, and I I see both sides, right? Because if you expand, you're going to get some more competitive matchups somewhere in there with the lesser teams, but the teams that are playing the eventual championship game (laughs) opponents, you're probably going to get smoked anyway, or or you might get smoked worse if you've... So I I don't know that that's the answer. And David, I'm curious, as we go down the ticket on bowl games, the lower tiers, you mentioned the, the players opting out. It seems like this trend, um, it's certainly growing and understandably, 
But is there a chance? Because we played less bowl games this year. A lot of games canceled. They couldn't find teams or they couldn't uh, conduct the, the travel, the safety, whatever it was. Um, we, we had many f- fewer bowl games this year. And I'm wondering if this is going to be a trend going forward. If with players losing interest in playing the lower tier bowls, uh, teams losing interest, in playing the lower tier bowls, do you think we could see any continuation of, Hey, maybe there'll be less bowl games in 2021. I think it's a, I don't know about 2021 simply because of contracts Mm. and, and such. And we're just starting a new bowl cycle. I mean, 20, the the 2020 season was supposed to be the start of a new bowl cycle. You know, ACC was going to send the team to San Diego to the holiday bowl and the holiday bowl got, canceled because of concerns in in California over COVID. But I I think beyond the the next contract, and and this contract is is for six years, but I wonder as as we continue to progress, it's a fascinating question. And and another component of this, NIL Mm. and athletes being compensated for their name, image, and likeness Stuart Mandel in uh, The Athletic in a mailbag had an interesting question from a reader who asked, what if bowls try to incentivize athletes to play as part of NIL? <laughs> and it's like, okay, you know, is a, is a, is a 20 grand uh, appearance going to persuade an athlete who may be looking at a million dollar pro contract to play in a ball? I, I don't know, but it, it, it was a really in, intriguing notion to me. Yeah. One of the, the more interesting projects we got to work on this year was that, that series that uh, Lee newspapers ran and we ran the, the components, obviously in the Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, you and I worked on it talking about all the different impacts of, of athlete empowerment. And mm-hmm. one of the stories was on, um, you know, name, image, likeness. And what was amazing was there are so many spokes like that, David. There's so many directions and it's nobody's fault, but I don't think we've thought of all of them. I don't yeah. think ADs and presidents have thought of all of them. I don't think agents and, and the people who stand to benefit from this have thought of all of them. I, I think you're looking at a, a situation where it's the right thing to do. They're going to get it done. It's going to be here. And then you're going to realize, oh, I never thought of this. And I never thought of that. And and that bowl question is a great one. Um, I think there's just there's so many interesting developments that are in our future on, on that front. Well, you're right, Mike. And what we, what we don't know, and, and the reason that none of us has thought of all the spokes here is because no one knows what it's going to look like. You have the upcoming NCAA convention this month. The association is working on its own NIL. Then you have competing several different bills in the halls of Congress involving NIL and athlete compensation. You've got the Supreme Court ready to hear a case on athlete compensation. We have, you know, we're we're recording this on, on Tuesday afternoon. As probably most of our listeners understand, there are two Senate special elections in Georgia today that will determine whether Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer is the majority leader of the Senate and how the the Senate ends up in terms of Republicans and Democrats could influence how NIL is played. Because the Republican bill might be a little more friendly to athletes and just an open market. It, it may go the other way if if the Democrats win. It, it th- there's no way to envision it because there's so much that's unknown. Well, as somebody who's been waiting nine months for my unemployment check from Virginia, I'm, I'm sure everyone loves the idea that the government will be involved in what's already a complicated right. issue. Because if there's one thing the U.S. government does, it certainly makes things run much more smoothly. <laughs> said said no one ever. Sarcasm fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, make sure nobody misinterprets that. I full confidence that the government will uh, step in and help us get this resolved. Now, that's the future, right? And there's so many questions. Before before we 
tackle that before we move on to today's show. Let, let's look at this national championship game because sure. we got there, and, and this is this is exciting. I mean, this is a good matchup. Uh, this is an intriguing game. Uh, these are two teams that have been very good. Now, Ohio State, they get banged because they didn't play very many games, mm-hmm. but they sure look good, David, <laughs> when they got the chance to be on the field. So um, what are you expecting in this one? What do, you, what do you see in this matchup? Well, they sure look good. Friday against Clemson. And this has come, you know, Justin Fields in the Big Ten championship game against Northwestern was average, maybe. Shaky. Subpar. And how many times do you see a quarterback have as many touchdown passes as incompletions? Hmm. I mean, that cat had six touchdown passes and only six incompletions against Clemson. And he threw four of those touchdown passes in obvious, mm. obvious distress. Because after taking that helmet to the ribs from James Skalski, that young man was hurting. And yes, he got some painkillers, but you could you could see him wince every, every time he threw. And still, he somehow managed to, to, to not only play, but to do so so effectively. But it, it, as good as he was, Trey Sermon's emergence at running back for Ohio right. State, I mean, it's it's reminiscent of Ezekiel Elliott in 2014 when Ohio State rode him to the Big Ten championship win over Wisconsin and then the two playoff victories over Alabama and Oregon. And sure enough, here comes Sermon, the transfer from Oklahoma, very quiet regular season, goes for a school record, 331 yards against Northwestern and then 193 against Clemson. Yeah, that Ohio State offense put on a a clinic that day. This Alabama offense (laughs) has put on a clinic all All year long. Now They've got two Heisman finalists. That doesn't include their star running back, and it doesn't include a receiver who's coming back into the fold now. David, this Alabama, you know, the, the SEC used to play some really great defense, and we can talk about that in a second. But this offense, this might be the best we've seen in a while. I texted a friend the other night and said, when did the SEC become the Big 12? <laughs> be, be, I mean, oh my gosh, the offenses are Unbelievable, and especially this one. You know, you 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 mentioned or referenced, you know, Devonte Smith, who very well may win the Heisman tonight. He may not be the the first receiver drafted from his own team. That's crazy. Be because because of 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 Waddle, and maybe he comes back for the national championship <laughs> game. He, he broke his ankle against Tennessee. He's considered the the, the best receiver that the Tide has, and, and the best pro prospect. But Smith has been incredible. Mac Jones, the quarterback, Najee Harris, and oh by the way, Alabama has two offensive linemen who were first team All Americans. They have five guys. Almost half the first team All America offense is from Alabama. That's it's one un- of my. That's unfair. It is, and it's one of my favorite sports topics or sports questions. And I've asked you a variation of this so many times, but I'm very curious to see if the gap between Alabama and Ohio State is greater, or the gap between kind of. Ohio State and, and everybody else. In other words, um, is this going to be competitive or was Alabama going to trounce anybody you put in front of them in the final two games and Ohio State was just the best of the rest? I'm, I'm very curious to see. Um, I hope it's a competitive matchup for my selfish personal entertainment value reasons. We all do, right? You talk about putting out the food and the drink and uh, you don't want your friends going home. Although I guess this year we won't have friends in our house, but you don't want people tuning out by halftime. Um, So what do you think? A a prediction. What are you looking at in this one? I think Alabama wins by multiple scores. Yeah. I think those statistics you gave us in the national semifinals, I think that's going to hold up in the finals game. I just think Alabama is that good. I, I, they've been that good all year long. Uh, they have the weapons in place and, you know, you talk about cultures and organizations and, and what they're built for. And, um, Alabama's ability to withstand the pandemic and do what they do, um, and Clemson too, you, you know, and Ohio State too, and uh, Notre Dame, they all deserve credit. 
you know, they had good teams, really good teams. Alabama has a great team. They had this massive curveball thrown their way. And I think we got to the end of the year and felt like, hey, man, they, they hit that curveball. They, they, they kept oh. doing what they do. It's not a, you know, they didn't limp in at eight and three and they were the best of the survivors or something. Alabama was Alabama all year long. And, and I think they're going to be Alabama on January 11th. And oh, by the way, they probably have the greatest head coach in the history of college football. <laughs> it's, it's his resume right now. It's hard to argue against that. It, it, it truly is. I mean, I'm sure there are people in Alabama who would, e- even as much as they love Nick Saban, would consider that, you know, just uh, the the worst thing you you could say because they worship at the altar of Bear Bryant. But Nick Saban is, I mean, that's it's just stunning. It really is. It's we could be heading towards Bryant. Denny Saban Stadium. Do they, <laughs> do, they, do they have any more hyphens they can use? There? Well, he's already got a statue out front. Rightfully so. Although we've we've seen, unfortunately, that those things can uh, go away uh, very easily in the world of college football. So college football, it's got the finish line in sight. David, basketball got going off to a rocky start. Bumpity bump bump. Still on the tracks, though. Still on the tracks. Duke went to Florida State expecting to play without Mike Krzyzewski, their Hall of Fame coach. He had a close COVID contact. Now the Blue Devils, they ended up not playing that game at all because the Seminoles had COVID issues, so it it became a non-issue. VCU's program, they just returned from a pause. And for us, Saturday's game between Tech and UVA, it had to be postponed to February because of a positive test uh, for a UVA staffer. Cavaliers are expecting to play Wednesday. We're recording this here on Tuesday. They're expecting to play Wednesday night at home against Wake Forest. Steve Forbes, the new coach there, his team has played only four games so far this season. UVA is not going to have a full roster for that one, assuming it's played at all. Here's Coach Tony Bennett on that situation. Uh, as of right now, um, we'll, we'll have enough. I mean, we're, we'll have we'll have enough to play, and um, we miss a few guys. It's more staffing and, and um, some players. And um, but we'll if everything stays the way it is, we'll be um, we'll be good to go. Not at full strength, of course, but uh, in a spot where, you know, if you can get games, you've got to try to play them and you want to be as ready as you can. And, um, you know, by being smart and safe, but then trying to be um, ready to go with with uh, opportunities that are in front of you. If you can get games in, you got to play them. I mean, that's got to be the motto right now for ACC and college basketball teams across the country. David, you wrote about this week, about this this week as well. And how are you feeling at this point about what we've got with this college basketball season? Mike, you were with me on on the weekly ACC Zoom yesterday. There is a lot of anxiety among the coaching ranks. Um, There's some hope, but... You could see it. You could hear it. You know, Roy Williams says he wakes up every morning and thinks, okay, what's going to happen to college basketball today? And Mike Bray, who had another game just this afternoon, (sighs) postponed. They're supposed to fly to Georgia Tech today to play the Yellow Jackets tomorrow. But there's a virus case at Georgia Tech within the program. So that game has had to be shelved. That's the sixth game that Notre Dame has had postponed or or canceled. And, you know, so far, the ACC is at about an 80% rate of games scheduled to games played. Now, some of them have had opponents juggled, but just in terms of sheer volume, the ACC is at about 80%. If it can continue that, then obviously, you know, they do get to, to the finish line and the entire sport probably does, but we're looking at and we're diving into the into the winter and students are returning to campuses from home holiday gatherings and we saw a spike after halloween parties heaven knows what's going to happen after new year's eve parties and i i i just don't know i mean i you know, I, I so very much want college basketball to happen again, selfishly, personally, professionally, the whole nine yards and, and for the, the athletes themselves. But there are moments where I, you can't help but wonder. Yeah, I think this is going to be the, the kid that uh, turns driving age and they want the car and they dream of the Ferrari or the Lamborghini and dad takes them down to the used car lot and <laughs> finds the jalopy that <laughs> that they're willing to buy them for the first car. I think this is going to be ugly. It's not going to be what we dream of, but if 
the engine starts, so to speak, I think that's a victory. And, and I think yeah. that's what you saw and, and heard from those coaches really uh, behind their words, what we saw in their faces and in their tone and in some of those exasperated sighs. I think they're realizing, hey, this isn't going to be a situation where you put your best product on the court oh, no. two or three times a week. And that's hard. That's hard for these coaches because that is what their cultures are built on is Every time out, it is your goal to put the best product you can forward. David, that's out the window. Your job now (laughs) is to put a product on the floor, a functional team, a team that is healthy, that understands what you want it to do in a given game. It's not going to be ideal. It's not going to be your best. And it's quite possible that when we get to the end of it, uh, we're not going to know who the better or best teams were. But uh, there's a good chance, I think, that we're going to reach the end in some form. Now, the end has changed. The NCAA has said this week they are putting the entire tournament in Indianapolis, the Indianapolis area. Uh, They're using a number of gyms and and arenas there. Uh, What do you think about that choice, David? Smart play? Oh, yeah. I I, I think it's really the the only play for, for several reasons. You're going to limit travel, which is an absolute must. You're going to a city and state that has the infrastructure for with gymnasiums, arenas, hotels, and all that. You're going to the home of the NCAA headquarters, which logistically helps the association as it tries to organize all this. So have, having been to many Final Fours in Indianapolis, t- to me, it was the only choice. Yeah, kind of reminiscent of, uh, and apologies to Jim Beheim here, but the ACC decision to to play yeah. its tournament in Greensboro, right? You just, anything you can do to make it easier, <laughs> you got to do. Because the easier you make it, the better chance there is it happens. Now, I look at this and say, this is, I think it's great. I think it's a great decision. Um, I don't love it, you know, obviously for fans that are, aren't going to get to go and um, the, the experience of the, of the sites around the country, that's part of the NCAA tournament. But this is about protecting the bottom line, the bottom line financially. You can't oh, yeah. afford to lose this event. And the bottom line of you want to end the year with an NCAA tournament. Is it possible to do it with regional sites? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. We're months away, right? But doing this kind of guarantees, hey, we can get to that point. We can get to that finish line we keep talking about. We're praising football for getting to the finish line. I think this protects the bottom line and gives the NCAA the best chance to have a tournament, however it looks, however it's earned, however you get there, uh, to have that happen come March. Yeah, I I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, Good luck to the selection committee <laughs> and, and 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 those folks as as they try to pick the field but yeah it's that they, they need that you mentioned the financial component of this obviously they lost the 2020 tournament but but you're talking about a billion dollar event you can't you can't lose a billion dollars in consecutive years <laughs> you, you you just can't and if you do, the the entire enterprise can crumble. Absolutely. Now, the ACC, we talked about their kind of weak finish to football season. They're 0-6 showing in the bowl games. Basketball-wise, David, um, the ACC, it's got nobody in the top 15 right now of, of the AP basketball poll. Now, there are five teams down there at the bottom, actually led by Virginia Tech at 19. Is this cause for concern or, or something that's going to correct itself as the season continues? I don't know if it will correct itself or not, Mike, simply because I think the teams are so evenly matched, number one. Number two, COVID will make will skew results in one way or another. And that way, I, I just think that teams are going to lose so many times, all of them, that you're going to end up with a champ, with a regular season champion, probably with five or six conference losses. And that's, that's usually not the way to get into the top 10. Uh, and in, in terms of concern, no, because I just think the season in and of itself is such a crapshoot that you just want to get as many teams in the NCAA tournament as you can. And whether they're ranked 15th or 5th at this point doesn't really matter. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, David, those initial net rankings came out this week and, you know, we joked earlier about how do you, how do you judge these teams? Well, Duke coach Mike Krzyzewski, he was asked about their relevance. Here's what coach K had to say. Figure out at the end, how you judge how teams get into the tournament. And because it's going to, uh, yeah, I just saw that the net came out. <laughs> I don't know how, you know, whatever, that's not going to be the way to do it. You know, I mean, I don't think, uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully people get a good, every program gets uh, a good number of games in where they can be judged. And then the NCAA, the committee will have to decide what is that judgment. Yeah. Quantifying this this year just seems impossible. This this figures to be the most challenging year ever for for the NCAA basketball selection committee, and that's saying something because it's it's always a hard job. It's always a big task. And uh, in my mind, this seems, David, like a year that they're not just going to look at bad losses, quality wins. They're going to have to look behind the scenes, right? They're going to have to know the story. Were teams coming off a COVID break and they hadn't practiced in 10 days or eight days? Were teams missing key players for for these big games, right? I mean, you, you can't just go by the numbers and say, okay, well, they beat this team in the rankings here and lost to this team. And um, you can't just go by the numbers and say, you know, tough noogies, everybody has problems this year, right? You, you got to go deeper. Yeah, it's going to have to be a little more nuanced than that, Mike and you don't think uh, Coach K noticed that Duke was one fifteen in the first in the first net rankings. Now they are incredibly, incredibly fluid on a daily basis early in in the season. So I, you know, I, I don't think Blue Devils fans need to be. Uh, you know, going off on the ledge here and thinking, oh my gosh, we're at 115 hour. Are we ever going to make the NCAA tournament? Uh, Duke is Duke, by the way, is the highest ranked ACC team in the Ken Palm rankings. So that just goes to show you how, how different things can be de- depending on which computer algorithm you, you prefer. So, but and I'm 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 really interested to have this conversation tomorrow. I'm scheduled to connect with A10 Commissioner Bernadette McGlade, who's a member mm-hmm. of the selection committee. And this is what I want to talk to her about: is you know the the, the difficulty of, of the task a, at hand. And you saw it with the college football playoff selections. You know, people wondered, and the selection committee had to figure out: okay. Ohio State only played six games. Clemson, Notre Dame, and and the others in Alabama played ten or eleven. You know how does that balance out? So it'll. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation with Bernie. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to to reading what you write because it it is it's so unusual. And and I appreciated Mike Shashevsky in that it wasn't about reacting to where anybody was in the first rankings. It was basically putting that out there in advance to say, hey, the rankings, the numbers, the metrics we usually use they they aren't they aren't the way this year. And I think he's right. And um, it's going to be fascinating to hear what she tells you because I I think it's just a simple, <laughs> if anything can be simple in these times. I just think it's a simple case of, hey, you're going to have to go deeper. You're, you're going to have to take that resume that you're so used to comparing and go another level of who was in, who was out. What was the story of your team, your state, your uh, university that week? And um, that's going to be tough. But I think just like football, I do think that the cream is going to rise to the top. Um I think you're going to see the teams with the most talent, with, with the best coaches, with the strongest culture. Um, you know, it's hard in basketball because so many more teams make the tournament. So many more teams have a shot, right? It's, it isn't always the one seed that wins the national title uh, or the overall number one that wins the national title. So it, it's a fascinating topic, and I think it gets us back to the way – um, maybe earlier in your career, David, the way these tournaments were selected, um, of a little more of gut feeling of who's who's good and who's bad, who's who's really worthy and who's not. And um, I just think the metrics aren't going to be as helpful this year. I think you're right, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, though, Mike. I think I think one of the top regional seeds 
is going to be Gonzaga. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've we seen Gonzaga in person now. We've seen Gonzaga on TV. Uh, Mark Few's program is legit. They uh, Maybe not the pedigree of Alabama, but in terms of dominance right now, uh, very comparable to what Alabama football has going. Nobody – I should say nobody wants to play Gonzaga. UVA volunteered to play them, but yes, uh, no, <laughs> and bless their hearts, but nobody has much of a chance. It seems like uh, when they step on the floor with Mark Fuse bunch right now. Yeah, they're they're going to be undefeated going into the tournament. I mean, it's going to be just like Kentucky going into the tournament unbeaten. Wichita State went into the tournament unbeaten. Vegas went into the tournament undefeated, but you got to go back to Indiana 76 to a team that got it all, you know, that really ran the table from start to finish. That's going to be a storyline to watch. So that's nationally. It brings us to the who you got and for who you got, we're focusing more on the ACC. Thank you, Mike. We're into the new year. And by now we've gotten to see at least a little bit of every team in the ACC. The question is, who's the best? Who you got? Let's start with Mike. You think I would have have an answer, <laughs> but I don't know that I do. Um, you, you know, right now atop the standings are Virginia Tech and Louisville, who play tomorrow night. Now, right. I'm not saying that's going to hold up, but I think that Virginia Tech has um, – really shown something early here and um, especially defensively. I mean, defensively, it looks like they have something that can hold up over the course of the season. Um, I say that as they go into this game with Louisville right now, to me, Louisville might be the best team. in. I I really like what Louisville has. I really like uh, their guard play. I really like what Chris Mack has talent wise. I think their backcourt of Carlick Jones, uh, who I wrote about today and David Johnson, um, that's a backcourt that just changes games and and is hard to, to match up with. So I know that they're not one of the teams right now in the, in the top 25. We already went over what the rankings mean. I like Louisville early this year. All right, David, how about you? I like Clemson. Mm. And all, all, you know, Clemson is tied with Virginia Tech at 19th in in the AP poll. Clemson is 15 in the first in the first net. And yes, the the Tigers lost to to Virginia Tech on the road, but that's their only loss, guys. And they have beaten. I, I wrote it down here because I knew I wouldn't memorize it. <laughs> They've beaten Mississippi State, Purdue, Maryland, Alabama, Florida State, and Miami. That's six P5 wins. That's really, really good. And Mike, you mentioned Virginia Tech's defense, which has been impressive. Clemson's defense has been even better. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, in Amir Sims, Clemson has a go-to guy. And that to me is what the Hokies lack right now. Not sure they've got, maybe it's Keve Aluma, but... Amir Sims is a proven go-to in the clutch. I can score in the post. I can step out beyond the arc. I can do all those things kind of player. So what what does 2021 have in store? Well, we'll start by saying we talk about who the best team in the ACC is. We both went through our answers. We didn't mention Duke. We didn't mention North Carolina, and we didn't mention UVA, who was the favorite going into this thing. Doesn't mean that they won't end up uh, near the top or any of those teams Correct. won't, but it, it does tell you what an interesting season I think we're in for. No, it's 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 going to be fascinating. I'm interested to see. You know, Mike, Virginia has two, you would think, very winnable games this week with Wake Forest and Boston College. And I expect the Cavaliers to win. And I, uh, if you would ask me to pick who's going to be at the top at the end of the year, I would still shade toward UVA. But if Virginia drops either of these two games this week, then I'm going to start to have s- more serious doubts. Yeah, you know, and we've said this on previous episodes, but think about the evolution of Virginia last year. Um, They -hmm. were what they were early. By the end, they won eight in a row going into the postseason. They were a trendy pick to to pull uh, pull it off and get it done in the ACC tournament. People were talking about, hey, maybe this team has a chance to defend its title after all. I think the Virginia team that goes to the NCAA tournament, because I do think they'll be uh, at that level, I think the Virginia team that 
steps on the floor for the ACC and NCAA tournament is going to be remarkably better than what we've seen so far. I think the defense is going to be better than what we've seen so far. And I believe that Sam Hauser, Thomas Wold, they're going to get going. Trey Murphy, um, they've got the outside shooters, the perimeter scorers to be much better offensively. Um, but yeah, right now, defense has stepped slow and and the offense seems to be uh, not quite there, not uh, not consistent at least. So um, reason for concern, but I think we both feel they'll, they'll get it done uh, by the end of the year. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Hauser, to me, so much hype, and hey, I think absolutely deserved. You look at what he accomplished at Marquette in a marquee league such as the Big East, and yeah, he's he's the real deal. But you mentioned being a step slow. He has been a step slow defensively, and he hasn't hit his stride offensively either. And they knew they need him to do both. They need him better on both ends, and I think he's capable. I think he will, and when that happens, as, as, as you said, it becomes a very different team. Absolutely. It was Wolda Tensei's three-point shooting last year that really transformed and got UVA going, and I expect Hauser uh, to have a similar impact at some point. <laughs> I don't know how long we'll have to wait for it, but at some point, I expect him to have that impact for Tony Bennett's team this year. Well, thanks for listening. You can subscribe to Teal and Barber on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And please consider supporting local journalism with an online subscription to the Times Dispatch. You can find special promotional offers available at richmond.com. If you forgot somebody's Christmas gift, you forgot somebody's gift at the end of the year, you're still shopping. Now's a great time to to throw that in the old uh, gift bag. Today's show was produced by Dean Hoffmeyer. Teal and Barber is a podcast of the Richmond Times Dispatch and Richmond.com. For David Teal, I'm Mike Barber. Thanks for listening. Be healthy and safe. And please join David and me again next week.